Hey, thanks for tuning into the Long Grade Lesson Show. It's a podcast that motivates and inspires leaders to pursue their passions and to leave a positive impact in their communities. All right. Hey, welcome back to yet again another episode of the Long Gray Lesson Show. Today, I have yet an another amazing guest, um, longtime friend, and you guys may remember him from my vlogs back in the day on uh, when it was Thomas Vlogs, not Long Gray Lessons. Today, I have Pascal Brun coming all the way from Haiti, and we're here in my studio in New York City. Welcome, Pascal Brun. Thank you very much, Tom. It's a pleasure to have you here. So how long did it take for you to fly from Haiti to New York? Uh, not too long, actually. There's a direct flight directly out of Port-au-Prince to JFK. Okay. Um, so about four and a half hours. Okay, not too bad. We got to have you here more often then. I know, right? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> okay, so it's it's been quite a while since we've last seen you. If, if the viewers remember correctly, um, we were roommates together yes. first year Absolutely. at West Point. Hell yeah graduated 2016 and um there's been a lot of development since right there has yeah a lot i mean over the last three and a half years now has it really been that long it's really been that long that is crazy seems like it was yesterday it literally does we're roomies we, we were making, making beats. chocolate ramen yeah, chocolate making ramen. <laughs> <laughs> Ref- refer to the videos on youtube guys if you guys don't know what we're talking about yeah but before we delve into what you're doing today and what's kind of um, happened since graduation, let's kind of roll it back a little bit. Okay. Let's go back to the origins. Tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of um, your, your beginnings. Okay. So um, for the viewers who don't know, my name is Pascal Brun. I was born in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And um, we ended up at west point together that's a funny story because when i was if i were to roll back in time even 10 years ago even until let's say sophomore year of high school i would have never imagined that um i would one have graduated from west point or two be working with the haitian national police so uh, i mean a hop skip and a jump into the future and here we are. It's started off, I, I went to a French Haitian school called L'Ecole Montessori d'Haïti um, up until fifth grade. And um, then I went to an American school in Haiti called Kiskeya Christian School. Um, my mom is from Guyana and my dad is Haitian. So I grew up speaking both French, Creole, and English. English is my mother's tongue. My mother's uh, first language and then because education opportunities in Haiti um, it's hard to get a top-notch education so and my family really believes that education is the number one most important thing um, to be able to how how can I best explain this I I, I don't want to to raise the 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 quality of life for everybody Mm -hmm. around you right and so we decided to apply to boarding school my brother went first he was a guinea pig Mm -hmm. Um, he went to culver military academy in indiana michael yes michael michael um and or we call him mikhail and mikhail went over first his first year was he loved it the first few months were really hard obviously because he was by himself and he left at uh 16 16 or 17 Um, but he ended up loving it the education was amazing and it was a military boarding school it had a leadership program one of the best in the United States boarding school system and so I followed him um, after his first year Mm -hmm. this is where things get a little crazy is um, after my brother's first year and I decided that um, I wanted to join him my first year over there just we i go through my first semester come back home for christmas break and then um as soon as i go back i we had to go early um i i believe we left on january 2nd or 3rd and then just uh, a week later there was the earthquake in haiti um on january 12 2010 
and that was the most devastating natural disaster in our written history mm-hmm. um and that w- that as a 15 year old my first time away from home um luckily my my family was okay my dad was still in haiti uh, my mom and my sister were in guyana because it was they, they my sister hadn't restarted school yet um me and my brother were stuck in indiana and it was it was a it was an interesting experience what do you mean by that it's hard to explain it's just we were hearing all these this news um on tv on the radio and talking about all the 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 destruction and this was in the capital as well where we're from and we hadn't even heard from our father in in and i think it was at two weeks at least and during that entire time it was just like wondering well if i put myself in my 15 year old body and think about what i was thinking of back then it was just like all right i'm 15 years old even if i were tr- to want to rush back what can you really do you know like I just you have to leave it up to you know the experts to do the job to to save the lives but everyone and i mean absolutely everyone that had anything to do with Haiti wanted to try to help and at 15 years old i didn't know what i wanted to do with my life but after that event i knew that i wanted to give my life to helping my community um helping to rebuild helping to learn um as many leadership skills as possible so that uh we could bring the community together and then kind of use a really bad situation um as an opportunity to relaunch a better stronger society and then that eventually led me to make the decision to apply to West Point as an international cadet and i got accepted um and then here we are that's crazy yeah so that's a little bit about uh, the before west point story Wow, and mm. not very many people know about this and kind of what like you said what it took uh, a negative event to kind of create that that shift in your mind as a 15-year-old. Yeah, absolutely because uh the and you know we don't it, it was a natural event. Nobody chose for that to happen. And that it was an interesting thing it was an interesting um experience to have to think about those things especially as a young person but it it's it's important to think about those things at any age is you never know when you're going to disappear you mm-hmm. know when when it's your time and whether you're a young person or you're in your old age every day that you breathe every day you get out of bed is an opportunity to do your best to inspire others to do good um to lift up your community to to be a leader um i mean we're we're here talking on longer lessons so it's really the focus is about leadership and um yeah it it was it was no there was no better time to to think about those things is there's a reason why i wasn't there i believe that i don't i i i believe that everything happens for a reason and if i don't know when my time is and especially after that event knowing that there's so many innocent people that are now gone because of a natural event and they didn't choose uh when they would leave then i want to spend every single second of my life working to better myself better others and improve my environment wherever i am so tell me about your your time at west point because at this time you recognize that this natural disaster had just happened and you're about to commit another 4 years away from your community how, how how did you um want to capitalize on this time away and what did what were you trying to get out of this experience hmm well i i mean kind of how i mentioned i i really wanted to focus on leadership um one of the one of the things that inspired me to go to West Point in the first place was I had some older cadet friends at at Culver um who I really looked up to um and they 
all decided to make the decision to apply to the service academies, whether it be West Point, Annapolis, or the Air Force Academy. And um, I said, okay, I want to follow that path. Because I thought that these individuals were young. I mean, think about it. They're, they're high school students. They're, they're cadets um, in, a, in a high school military program. And me being a young teenager, young adult, for me to be so impressed by the way that they communicated, the way that they um, expressed themselves and their values, I said, okay, well, if I look up to these individuals, and it just so happened to be also a military academy, a military school, so a lot of our instructors were former Army officers, former Marine officers, uh, Army and Marine NCOs, so I was really surrounded by that environment. I really had a pre really appreciated the military leadership and the military structure. Something that lacks big time in Haiti is um, that that attention to detail, that discipline, that that desire to to bring people together and move forward with a plan. So that's why. I think that the decision to go to West Point was to capitalize on learning that, something that I think could really benefit ha the Haitian community mm -hmm. is excellent planning, attention to detail, um, because we have a lot of other fantastic qualities. Haiti is a really strong community, as is. So when you take a very strong, tight-knit community and then you sprinkle in some some discipline, some attention to detail, some some precise planning. Anything is possible, and I really mean anything. Uh, that kind of goes back to like uh, Haitian history with the revolution and uh, the the slave rebellion and the the Haitian military leaders that that brought both black and mulatto communities to 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 fight for freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you bring together a tight knit community, and again, those military they were military leaders. Uh, you bring in that attention to detail and those precise plans it leads to freedom and you were able to get that at West Point the military leadership absolutely yes uh, I mean West Point is really a, a fantastic opportunity to learn about um, le leading others inspiring others changing hearts and minds what was the most difficult part of going through West Point for you on a personal personal level mm, that's a good question I think you know to be honest I was always worried about going back home um, I, I don't look like your average Haitian um, my French isn't great at the time my Creole was better than my French, but it also wasn't amazing. And I was a bit self-conscious about, you know, integrating into Haitian society for the first time, um, being a professional, uh, especially coming from an environment that is very different from Haitian culture. And then trying to assimilate back and w all while incorporating, weaving these new principles and uh, these new elements of this, this military culture into my environment, my workplace, um, because that was a plan all along is to, to try to weave in exactly what we just talked about, you know, that discipline, that attention to detail, um, that, uh, that go-getter mentality of, you know, making plans and sticking to them. Yeah, that, that, that always was in the back of my mind is what will my compatriots think of me? Um, but it, it turned out amazing way better than I could have ever imagined um, there are definitely people that are right off the bat are very judging um, but that's that's normal because when something isn't done when something is not the norm there's always going to be doubt there's always going to be a little bit of judgment like why are you doing this what is your ulterior motive um, but for the large majority of the individuals that are in my environment for for the most part um they're very well receptive they were they were very encouraging um because i came in laterally into the haitian national police 
with a rank equivalent to I mean in 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 the US Army it would be the equivalent of a first lieutenant but in Haiti where I came in as a principal inspector my colleagues were people with you know 20 23 years experience um, but they are on their way out and it's the first time that somebody with this education has come in um, and come to work with them and come to help build capacity and come to help share everything that I learned with them and for the most part I'd say a solid 80% of the of my colleagues um, they were saying you know what Pascal we're on our way out we're taking care of our kids our kids are your age and they say if I want you to be successful so that my kids can have a better ki- Haiti to live in and that was I was that was relieving and that was encouraging and that was motivating and inspiring and uh, on the tough days that's what keeps me going wow that's that's so crazy to think about because you know these conversations that you're having and the level of responsibility that you have you know none of our classmates would think this is what you're about to go through Mm -hmm. i don't i don't even know if you're about to go if you were thinking about this on graduation day where we threw our hats up in the air we say goodbye to west point and then what's 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 next for you I right thoughts were racing for me because i didn't even know what the hell was going to go on i didn't know i was going to go into the asian national police i mean what was what was the state of haiti at that point in time oh there was well at the at the time there was a there was a growing um there, haiti was just working on rebuilding its army so i wasn't sure if i was going to go into the army or into the police um but as time went by the decision was made for me to go into the police and then uh, here I am and so what did that transition look like like tell me about I uh, you you just graduated from West Point I'm sure you took some some leave like the rest of us and then it was time to get to work yeah you're back in Haiti what what was that process like what what were you experiencing Wow that the process was very frustrating very very frustrating i spent so while all of you my my american classmates you all took your leave and then everything was almost like it's it's a well-oiled machine you're you you know the steps you know what to expect you're gonna come in you're gonna pin on your bars you're gonna put your uniform on you're gonna get to work do all the administrative paperwork and then you know eventually after you finish your classes you'll get your platoon you'll get to work for me after we took our cadet leave i got back to haiti and um there were there was a a a long lull of no work me waiting to hear back from my government about what i would do what would be my first post what would be my job um and then once I did hear back, then I worked for quite a while without pay and then got back pay because of bureaucracy, basically. There's just, the, the, there's no better way to explain it. It's, but I mean, there's bureaucracy in any government system. I did, however, take advantage of the lull in the time before, uh, once I got back before I started work to spend a lot of time with my grandpa, a lot of time with my family started my vlog Mm -hmm. um which was so much fun um and what do you talk about on that vlog what what is so the the theme of the vlog was make it happen um i was just talking to my brother about this just the other night is that i i was a bit down in the dumps getting back because i wasn't working you know just graduated from west point um i'm living with my parents because i I don't have work um and then you know i realized you know what i just got all this leadership training you know i'm i'm a military officer i can make anything happen so i figured okay until i get this call from the government i'm gonna use my time 
to explore. You know, I'm going to use my time wisely. I'm going to think about a message that I want to share with my community. And I'm going to try to get that message out there. So, and the key element of this plan was that I wanted to try to do this without spending any money because I didn't have any. <laughs> you got to get creative at that you point. You got to get creative. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And um, just through community, you know, I realized you can make anything happen through community. It's not money that makes things happen. It's community that makes it. Community, social capital. Yeah, crowdsource. Is so much more valuable than financial capital. Hmm. So much more valuable. The, 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 the network that you build, the people that you get to know, the relationships that you construct in your environment, as, and uh, the richer those relationships, the better. That's what gets you moving. Because I feel like a lot of people will say, oh, I can't do that because I don't have the money for it. Okay, fine. I understand that. However, there's always a way to do it without you having the capital in your hands as well because somebody has the capital. So what I learned during my time before working for the Haitian National Police is that when you build a community, when you have something to offer, that really gets things going. I was able to, um, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker but I have a camera. So let me learn how to edit some videos. And then that started since we were at West Point, mm -hmm. we just went on YouTube and figured it out right. and experimented. Um, when I got back to Haiti, I decided, okay, let me see, uh, there's a group of my family friends that go on these off-road rallies. And, and I offered to the organizer to do videos for them. I said, okay, great, that's awesome. Uh, Let's, let's see how it works. So I, I just jumped into one of the passenger seats and started filming vlogs. Um, and wow, did they love it. And the people watching my vlog episodes loved it too. It was like, because there's so many places in Haiti that are not on film and they're gorgeous places. And the, the people are so kind and nice. And, and it, was, it was really like awesome to be able to share all those sights and scenes and people. And both the diaspora community and the, the local community really enjoyed the videos. I ended up getting sponsored by uh, Inoto, which is uh, a car and, and vehicle, like off-road vehicle company. And they gave me uh, an ATV to, wow. to go on the rides. Um, we did a program that was uh, sponsored by Haiti Air Ambulance. So then we jumped on a helicopter and went up to the mountains where there was a rally going on. And all of this, like, I was the one filming these things and my objective was to get as much beauty in Haiti on film as possible, send a message about how bringing community together, showing the positivity in an, er in an environment that can be so easily viewed as being negative and then showing the other side of the coin. Um, that was my message and um, I did it without spending a dime. Wow. That's very inspiring. And um, that actually makes me think about, like, one, you, you found a way to add value, although without really, sp like you said, without spending any money. Right. And you weren't getting paid at the time. Nope. Initially. I'm sure you could have easily just came back to the States and found a, a job <laughs> at a Fortune 500 company or something. Yes. What? Yeah. What led you to stay and what kept you motivated to, to keep doing what you're doing? It's, it's really, it's the mission. And uh, it's, I believe it's my life's mission. Um, the, Haiti right now is a very tough place to live in. It's a very tough place to work in. And it's even tougher in the public sector. Um, and, you know, with, with long conversations with my parents, both my mom and my dad, and especially with my dad, we came to the conclusion that my dad would always say, Pascal, this path is one of the toughest paths that you can take. 
but we're in it to try to do our best to do what we can based off of what God has blessed us with these opportunities um, to try to change the country for the best you know and if there's no point in staying in the country if it's not to do this work this kind of work because if I'm just going to work in a business and make money I might as well just make money here in the US or elsewhere Mm -hmm. you know because why go through all the pain and suffering and hardship when if the goal is to make money then I could do that elsewhere and make way more with less hardship with less headache so really it's it's not about you know the it's not about the the money it's not about it doesn't even matter what the work is as long as the work is towards building a stronger healthier country because the, the the country is very sick right now what has been the hardest part of this experience so far for you oh wow that's the hardest part that's a very good question the hardest part is experiencing w- what I, and I can't even say the average Haitian experiences it's not even that um, it's as close to the average as I can get to experiencing what the struggle is for a Haitian working in the Haitian National Police which is which is a very secure job um, in fact, to give you an example, I right now work as an instructor at the National Police School. And um, we had 13,000 applicants for s- about 700 slots. The population of Haiti, more than 50% of the population is less than the age of 35. We have a very young population. We have 12 million people in the country. Everyone's looking for a job. And there are not that many jobs to go around. Not only that, but not everybody has an education opportunity. And so they're left helpless. Trying to make ends meet, trying to hustle. And um, there's... I feel like there are in Haiti there there's social classes, so socioeconomic classes, um, and there's a big divide between those classes. Um, I think for the most part, and this is me just speaking personally, that um, there's a lack of effort for different classes to get to to know one another, to get to understand one another. Um, it takes sacrifice you know from people who are um blessed well endowed um to get to understand people who haven't had the same opportunities at education or wealth and then it also takes a, a large effort for people who haven't been blessed with opportunity or wealth to be able to have the open ears to be able to want to listen to somebody who was born into a family that had every opportunity in the world because I, I, I think y- you can already picture or imagine being in that position where and I'm a very spiritual person because of this because I've thought a lot about these situations we don't pick our families right you didn't choose the opportunities that were given to you the opportunities were presented to you and then you made the best of those opportunities thank God I was born and I thank God every day I was born into a family where we had struggles, but those struggles weren't necessarily to to put food on the table every day. Whereas that is a very genuine struggle for a large majority of Haitian people. I think you can understand that it would be difficult. To s- you, you would feel sour if you weren't given those opportunities. And you see, s- you, you know, I, I mean you'll see a huge fancy hotel next to slums. And if you're living, if you're one of those individuals living in the slums and you look at that fancy hotel and people swimming in the pool, drinking their cocktails, you'll grow up being very sour. 
Because it's like, why do those people get that opportunity and I don't? And what have those people done to try to help me out? Because very often, it's not very visible what kind of actions are being taken to try to lift the entire community and not just pockets of communities. And so I think the hardest part of what uh, of these last three years is getting to understand that better, getting to understand the struggle of my colleagues. I have colleagues who, with the very little that were paid in the Haitian National Police, they have kids my age that they're trying to send to college or even just to high school or middle school. They can't even pay rent. How the hell are they going to pay college? And they know that education is what it takes for them to succeed. So me standing next to them as a young person half their age with their rank, it's very humbling. It's very, very humbling. And that's been, I've, I've had some hard nights just thinking like, you know, why is there this, this unfairness in life? And that, that is definitely the hardest part is like looking at myself and being like, why did I deserve this? Um, but then it's remembering. I didn't pick my family. I didn't pick my opportunities. My family made the best of the opportunities that were given to them, and I'm going to do the same. This is why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. And what are you... Um, I know you mentioned that you're an instructor, but what are you doing today? And... Um, what do you what do you hope to accomplish um right now i'm so i would really love to share with my community as much about leadership as possible uh, the, what i've been working on over the last three years at the national police school is building a leadership program and it's f quite similar to the to the west point leadership program i i modified it to be adapted for the police instead of a military um, and I really focus on different elements about culture um, so that it could be applied in Haiti. So I want to try, and I, I, I was in the most strategic place to do so. I, I was at the National Police School where we have a basic training program um, that trains over 700 police per training session, which is about seven months. So in the last three years, we've trained, uh, over, er, over the last three years, excuse me, We've trained well over 2,000 people um, because we also have concurrent training coming through with all the different police units. And I've been sharing my leadership program for the first time in the 24 years of existence of the Haitian National Police. This program that is just specifically geared towards leadership and ethics. And um, that's something that I feel right now that I can be proud of because that's something that I've, even if I were to leave the, the school tomorrow, I would feel like I've, I've done something for my compatriots. I've shared what I learned at West Point. I basically summarized four years of leadership education and I'm trying to give it to as many people as possible. Wow. That, uh, that is phenomenal. And um, that, just, that just shows like you're, you're applying your West Point knowledge and experience and really making it work. Um, how, I'm curious, like, how important is character development in your, your leadership program at, at the school? It's the most important. It's really the most important. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a double challenge. I, working at the National Police School, I realized why um, I mean, you always hear about in the U.S. how it's a volunteer army. It's not a draft. You're not forced to do a certain amount of years of service. Um, and I understand why. Because in Haiti, people go into the police out of necessity, not because they want to. There, there are definitely some Haitian citizens that have a desire to serve. Um, and they do so out of, you know, their own hearts and, and minds and they, they want to do their part as a Haitian citizen. Yes, that exists, but it, it's a small minority. The large majority of people coming into the police are doing it out of necessity because it's a very stable job. You, you're guaranteed to get paid. Um, 
So w working with that kind of community where they're not coming in because they want to, they're coming in because they have to, gets difficult. Mm. So really my focus um, on this leadership program was to instill in these new up and coming police officers um, the importance of service, um, to, to have them understand the impact that they can make as a leader in a community, um, to kind of build that desire to serve instead of seeing it as just service out of complete necessity. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's certainly a challenge, right? Like we're talking about how do we incentivize um, these folks with the little pay that you, you have, it has to be from within. It has to be intrinsic. They have yeah. to be inspired. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. And, and, you know, what better way to do it than um, at basic training where you learn the foundational knowledge and, and inculcate those values. Yep. So um, tell me, what, tell me what, what's next. What, what is next from uh, to continue your, your vision? And, and the strategy, what, what can you do to continue moving forward? You know, I don't exactly know what's next because I, I, can't, I don't really make the choices of where I'll go work next and what unit I'll be sent to or what my post will be. Um, however, wherever it is that I do end up, I know that um, I'm gonna be applying what I learned in leadership, trying to help as many people, trying to share what I learned about leadership at West Point with as many people as possible. That's always gonna be the main objective. Um, also, systems engineering has been fantastic so far. That was <laughs> what- You could thank Major Bu for that one. I know, seriously, thanks Major Bu. <laughs> you, you're the one who convinced me to switch over, so. That was our Taekwondo props, coach. Props coach, <laughs> thank you sir. Um, yeah, the system, engineering management and systems engineering has been, I mean, it's all about optimizing processes. And there's a lot of optimization to be done <laughs> in, uh, in these public institutions. So that has helped out a lot, yeah. What, what, is, uh, what is the overall, um, like, where would you see yourself like in five, 10, 15, 20 years, like what is the goal? Where would, where would you be happy with what you've done? Oh man, what would the result that look is like? such a hard question to answer because there's so many unknowns. There's yeah. so many unknowns. Yeah. There, uh, there's not really a career path. There's not really. Do you see yourself staying in Haiti? Oh, for sure. Okay. No, yeah. And that's, that's kind of why I mentioned the conversations that I had with my parents and with my dad is that th we're in it for the long haul. This is not, this is like, it's we're in it <laughs> i'm not going anywhere you're in it to the end absolutely yes for sure no matter how hard it gets no wow. matter how dangerous it is so i hope that um you know as you continue this that we can get more um international students from haiti to come forward because um you can't do it by yourself right oh nope. and um this is a very tough and difficult mission especially during this time and you're certainly making waves by being able to be at the tactical level and inspiring these students but um there needs to be more absolutely what um what would you want to ask um m maybe whether it's the viewers whether it's your classmates or alumni like how, how can we help is there any way that we can do anything well if there's anything that I've learned over the last three years and through West Point as well, is you can't do anything alone. C cooperate you know, to graduate. Cooperate right? to graduate. Yep. Right. In uh, even on the Haiti flag, right the, on the coat of arms, it's l'union fait la force. It's union makes strength. So that rings so true and especially through the hardship that haiti is is undergoing right now people are really banding together and trying to see how they can strengthen their communities in whatever way they know if there was one thing that i could say uh, and take the opportunity to say is that 
the Haitian community is so much larger than just the 12 million people in Haiti. We have millions of Haitians all over the world, in the United States, in Canada, in France. Th those are our largest bubbles of, popu of Haitian population, but they're really all over Europe, you know, all over, there, there's even Haitians in Africa and in Asia as well. Um, it's, and we, we learned something um, in, I, th I believe it was in our uh, EN 302 class, mm. our English, mm -hmm. English courses at West Point, is that uh, this concept of imagined communities. A state is defined by its borders but a nation is not. A nation can extend far beyond your landlocked borders. And the Haitian nation is a very strong nation. It's a very tight-knit community, regardless of where you could be in the world as a Haitian. And Haitians take, look like any other person, white, black, Asian, and other. They're, I, and having friends of every shade, every ethnicity, every background, um, it really rings true that uh, it's being Haitian is not about living in Haiti. It's about how, knowing where your heart is and then doing something for that community and seeing yourself as a part of this nation. And I would really love to encourage, and I know the diaspora community all over the world, the Haitian diaspora is looking at what's going on in Haiti right now. And they're asking themselves, what in the world can I do? We need to really push to start those conversations as a community is how can we all get involved regardless of your geographical location? How can we all get involved? to make a difference, to help Haiti move forward. We need to move forward right now. We need, and if you study, um, like th there's this, this concept of a, a brain drain, right? When there's a lot of uh, socioeconomic unrest, political unrest, um, people with higher level educations, people with really good jobs, they'll often leave their geographical location to go work elsewhere or where maybe their skills and talents will be better valued. This is so what's going on in Haiti right now. There's the, it, the, we're, we're suffering from a brain drain. There's hundreds of thousands of Haitians fleeing the country, going to South America, trying to get to the United States or Canada or Europe or elsewhere, um, legally and illegally. And it's because things are getting very difficult now we have some of the most talented individuals at the top of every industry and these are i, I know many of them they they're, they're thinking about well at some point i want to come back to haiti and retire but you're not going to have a place to retire if you don't think about <laughs> how you're going to contribute mm -hmm. So that you can have that spot to retire to. Time is now. Time is now. Yeah. So let's 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 get together. Let's right dance. to to the Haitian diaspora. Um, to the Haitians in Haiti, let's start having these conversations together, and uh, think about how we can put all of our skills and talents that we've learned all over the world, and uh, see how we can adapt them to build a better, stronger Haiti. Wow. Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, we are running low on time here. And so uh, I want to close out by asking, um, where can we continue this conversation? Where can we learn more about um, what you're working on and, and how do we how do we connect with you, Pascal? Fantastic. Uh, my Twitter is Pascal Abrun. My Instagram is Pascal Abrun. Uh, you should also find me on YouTube. I believe it's Pascal Brun Haiti. Uh, I can't remember if it's Pascal Brun or Pascal Brun Haiti. However, if you search for Pascal Brun on YouTube, uh, you will definitely find all of my videos. 
Um, we can definitely continue this conversation on any one of those platforms. Um, and let's do that. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. All right, guys. Go follow Pascal. We'll see you guys in uh, the next episode.